Hello and welcome to the very first lecture of Social Work 422. You will find as you go through the modules that I will record first a lecture based on the textbook, which is individuals and families um, stress and cri individual and family stress and crisis um, that you will purchase or um, will be provided by the school. I'm not sure how it's going to work this for this particular textbook because there's no e version of it. However, I will have uploaded this very first chapter for you to give you time the first couple of weeks to order the book and have it delivered to you in the event that it's not provided to you by the, uh, by the School of Social Work, by the uh, SUNA. So um, you will read the text, then you'll come and do this lecture that I'm recording, uh, one for each module, uh, for each chapter, and you'll notice that every um, Every module is based on a chapter of the book, so there'll be 11 modules, uh, followed by um, 11 content modules. There'll be two modules that are introductory modules, 11 content models, and then you'll find modules at the end for um, the midterm exam, for where to submit your paper, and for the final exam. Uh, you don't have to worry about those yet. We'll get to those later in the semester. In the meantime, if you've not already done so, stop watching this lecture go back and read the chapter that I've uploaded for you, then come back and watch this lecture. Okay, with that said, this is about the history of stress theory. And I'm moving on to the next slide. Stress theory has two components, well, there's multiple components, but two that we're gonna be focused on. One is individual stress theory, and the other that we'll spend most of our time talking about is family stress theory. Now, individual stress theory has four schools from which it was derived. The first is psychobiology. In psychobiology, it's probably the kind of thoughts that you have about stress right now. It's about the individual and their internal reaction to stress. So psychobiology, <coughs> excuse me, explored the connection between the emotions associated with stress and what that does to our physiology or to our body. If you remember from uh, human behavior in the social environment, our bodies have responses to stress that are both short-term, intermediate, and can have long-term consequences on our health. A second school of thought was a sociological school of thought. And in here, in this school, they were looking at how people and society copes with the stress that uh, society kind of places people under. They found that positive reactions to stress were part of a process of coping that we now consider to be resilience theory or resiliency. Psychiatry, which as you remember is a combination of kind of psychological thinking, but also the physiological. So psychiatrists are medical doctors who practice in the psychological arena. Psychiatry explored the inner world of individuals and how we react to stressors and the impact that these stressors have upon our coping. And then anthropology, which is the study of humans, right, uh, helped explain what happens when individuals experience crisis and what it takes to manage those individual crisis responses or reactions. Next slide. Now we turn to family stress theory. Now I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide but it's an important one because it contextualizes all the stuff we're going to talk about for the next few moments. And you can see the timeline from the 1920s up until about the 2000s and the various thinkers uh, throughout the ages. So you had Abigail and Kavan and, and Rank in the 1930s, and then in the 1940s you had Coos uh, and then Hill with his roller coaster model. In the 1950s, Hill came back with the ABCX model and the ABCXX model. In the 1980s, you see the double ABCX model being developed. Further, you see the FAR model uh, being developed. Um, you have a McCubbin and McCubbin in their topology model and then Burr's model. By the 1990s, you begin to see the resilience model emerging uh, that we already have begun to talk about. And then Cornell and Barato begin to talk about their model and then Boss's model in the 2000s. But I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this slide talking about that because we're gonna talk about that in the next few slides. So here we go, next slide. So the first era, the late, uh, the 1920s to the late 1940s. 
And in this first era, we see um, several theorists beginning to develop a model of family stress. In 1936, Angel explored how families respond to or adapt to acute stress, the, the very heavy duty stress in the moment that kind of is stressing people out. In 1938, Kavan and Rank studied how a family's internal organization, how families organize themselves, and we'll talk about more about that in the future, how their togetherness and how their overall functioning help them cope with stressful situations. In 1946, Coos developed a model called the profile of trouble that we will turn to in chapter three of the text. Next uh, slide. The second era is the late 1940s up until the late 1970s. Notice it's a 30 year span here during which um, some work was done on this, but it really took off after into the late 70s and then afterwards. Hill in 1949 took Coos theory and develop that into the truncated roller coaster profile of adjustment, which we will read more about and learn more about in chapter three. Later, he would take his own model and explore the, expand this into the ABCX model, which continues to impact our subsequent understanding of crisis and stress management and how families respond to them. Next slide. The third era was from the late 1970s into the mid 1980s. This is when I came into my own, <coughs> excuse me, as a social worker and began to develop uh, when I went to social work school uh, in the mid to, mid to late 1980s. And so I was firmly steeped in this third era. In 1989, Burr um, began to think about um, family weakness and how it was a limitation of the model. And so Burr then expanded his thinking from family weakness or the reaction to stress into a thinking about how families have strengths. And some families are able to really cope with uh, stress using specific strategies. And he began to look at those strategies. And then he took all of that and put it into a family systems model. I will turn to that in chapter four and subsequently. McCubbin and Patterson took Hill's ABCX model and then developed that into the ABC, the double ABCX model, which accounted for coping uh, strategies and other variables. Keep in mind that the 1980s was when family systems theory really began to take off. Um, and we began to think as social workers about doing family therapy as a way of kind of carving out a niche for ourselves in the world of psychology and psychiatry. And so this became part of our clinical um, thinking as family therapists and as social workers. The fourth era was from the mid 1980s and it continues to the present. So we're still developing this fourth uh, era. The family adjustment and adaptation response model uh, came about during this era. It's called the FAR model. McCubbin Dr. and Dr. McCubbin, husband and wife team, developed the typology model of family adjustment and adaptation and the resiliency model. So you see this notion of family systems, uh, family structure, and resilience beginning to take off. Burr in 1989 adapted Ku's work to show the processes that families go through to adapt to stress. Corneal et al. Uh, focused on processes and consider the impact of culture, how culture, the culture that we live in, impacts the way families react to stress. Um, keep in mind, if you come from a kind of a stiff upper lip culture where you kind of keep stress inside and you don't talk about it much, that's one way. Or an emotive culture where you feel free to kind of really express yourself and your anger or outrage uh, or your you know happy emotions would have an impact right on how we respond to stress. Boss in 2002 expanded upon the ABCX model to develop the contextual model of family stress. So these are the four eras that kind of defined how families respond to stress. Now for the next few slides, I want to turn to six assumptions about a family, about family stress. 
This is not in the book, but it's a little bit extra. So move to the next slide, please. Assumption number one, even strong families can be stressed to the point of crisis and thus become immobilized. Remember that even families that have tremendous resources, both external and internal, upon which they can draw, can still have that straw that broke the camel's back, right? And can be overwhelmed at times by crisis. Next slide. A second assumption is that there are differing values and beliefs that families have, which influence how they define what is distressing and how they derive meaning from what is happening. Keep in mind that what is stressful for one family may not be stressful for another. For example, I was driving home from our community center, dropping kids off one night, and we encountered police tape at the corner. There had been a murder, a shooting, and the person that I was with, the kid that I was with, said, oh, I want to go see what's happening. Now, if that had happened in a wealthy neighborhood where there were far few uh, murders, um, the person would have been appalled and would have run in the other direction. And so what a family believes or what they value, for example, if a family is a, a strongly religious family and believes that crisis produces opportunities for growth, they're going to approach stress very differently from one who is uh, more humanistic and feels like a, maybe a stressor is problematic and difficult. Um, and so this all helps a family to give definition to what they consider stressful and to then move to, de to derive meaning from that stress. Keep in mind that stress can either teach us lessons or can immobilize us. And so for families that know how to contextualize and deal with stress and have a value system and a belief system that helps them address stress from a proactive point of resilience and strength and recognizing that challenges produce opportunities, those families are going to respond very differently to stress. Next slide. Assumption number three. The meaning that people construct about an event or a situation is often influenced by several factors, including gender, age, race, ethnicity, and class. Males deal differently with stress than females do. Older people with more life experience may deal with stress differently than younger people who had less experience would. Race. Those of us who come from you know, a white middle class background might have one experience of stress, whereas somebody who comes from an urban lower class Hispanic background might have a very different uh, response to stress. Ethnicity, um, you know, how our, kind of our ethnic heritage, how Irish people or Jewish people or uh, Mexican people versus Honduran people, uh, they may have a, a different reaction or contextualization of stress. And then finally, class. People in the upper classes deal with stress differently than people in the middle class or people in the working class or people in the underclass. Next slide, please. A fourth assumption about families and stress or this, because the mind and body are connected, that what happens in our head has impacts for what happens in our body, psychological stress can make people physically sick. Now, I've included a video in this module um, that you can watch, for, for that you need to watch, that you will watch to further help you understand this concept about how um, stress can make you physically sick. But when, when one person is stressed in the family system, the entire family is stressed. Because remember, what happens to one person in a system or one part of the system affects all other parts of the system. So psychological stress can make people physically sick, and that process can impact the entire family system. Next. <coughs> Assumption number five. Some family members are constitutionally stronger or resilient in handling stress than others. Right now I have a foster daughter that comes from a family whose mother has a, a problem with a, with, a, with a drug addiction and her father has a problem with an alcohol addiction. Neither are functioning very well and so she often comes 
and stays at our house. So we're kind of like a, a, a foster family, although it's an informal foster arrangement. Stoney comes from a family that is highly stressed. There have been murders, there's been periods of homelessness, there's been lots of drug addiction, uh, and her life has been topsy-turvy. However, Stoney is now enrolled in Spelman College and has an A average. She graduated from Ben Franklin, which is a very tough school with an A average with high, high honors. So this is an amazingly high functioning individual. Her sister, however, barely graduated high school and is constantly in crisis, uh, has her own problems with finances, with drugs, with other stuff. So Stoney and her sister are both raised in the same environment, really close in age, and yet one has responded very differently than the other to the stress of growing up in this family. So remember that some people are just wired differently and they tend to be more resilient overall. Next slide, please. Our sixth assumption is that it's not always bad for a family to fall into crisis, to be under stress. Some families have to hit bottom and then work their way up into recovery. Those who uh, fall apart can become strong again and even stronger than they were originally. There is an old saying in the world of family therapy that um, crisis produces opportunity and crisis plus opportunity produces change. Unless we experience some form of crisis, we kind of stay the way we are, right? But when we experience crisis, we're shifted off balance and have to do something different. So stress and crisis is not always a bad thing. In fact, it's a time for rebuilding. Next slide, please. Boss defines stress as any pressure or tension in the family, a disturbance in the steady state of the family or the homeostasis of the family. So families tend to function in a certain way and when something happens, it throws that balance or homeostasis off. Any, anything that throws the balance of the homeostasis in the family off is stressful, but stress is normal and occasionally even desirable. In fact, great athletes are under stress a lot of the time. They stress their body out by working it out. They stress their body out by practicing. They stress their mind out by thinking through everything. Uh, great performers, the same way. In fact, Luciano Pavarotti, the great soprano, uh, the great tenor um, uh, opera singer, once said, if I don't feel stress when I go on the stage, it's time for me to quit because that stress is a kind of performance anxiety that propels me to greatness. So stress happens to everyone, thus it's normal. And sometimes it can be helpful to moving us along. I want you to think for a moment about this picture on the right. This is a picture of a car. In fact, all the component parts of the car are there. You can see the muffler, so the exhaust system, you can see the seats, you can see the tires, you can see the cams, the camshaft, the valves, the lifters, you can see the gears, you can see all the parts of the car. And so I would ask you, is this a car? Now, some of you would have answered, yes, it's a car. All the pieces and parts are there, so this is a car. Others would have answered, no, this is not a car because until the pieces and parts are put together, this is a non-functional unit. So it's got all the pieces and parts, but they're not put together. There's a concept in social work called the gestalt, G-E-S-T-A-L-T. And this is defined as the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So how does this apply to our work together? Well. Let's think about family, families for a minute. A family is more than just a collection of individuals cohabiting the same space, but rather it's an aggregate, a collection of particular relationships, shared memories, successes, failures, aspirations. In other words, when the family is considered together, it's more than just a collection of individuals, 
but it functions as a whole. That's the gestalt. If each of those people in that family were on separate deserted islands, their life would be completely different than if they were raised in the same household or nearby together. In other words, when the collection comes together, it's something different than the assorted individuals. You could have some of the greatest athletes in the world, but until they come together on the same team, you have a collection of individuals all vying for personal attention or for personal records, but not playing for the team. But when that unique championship team comes together, something different comes about. This is the notion of gestalt. The whole is greater, there's more when all the people are together than the sum of their individual parts. Which brings us to the systems view of the family and, um, and a very important thought for this course. We really, when we think about families, need to assess the family as a whole. We assess the individuals, of course, but we also need to think about the family context in order to get the full picture. So when we're doing assessment of stress and crisis, we need to think about how all these people are working together or playing together or living together and how the collection of individuals impacts stress. And that's why we have a individual stress theory and a family stress theory. We can't just apply individual stress theory to families because something different is happening when families, when the individuals are collected in the same space. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Next slide. And this is our final slide. I want you to think about something called symbolic interactionism for a moment. You've studied this in, in HBSC and elsewhere in your time here at SUNO and in the School of Social Work. A family under stress creates a symbolic reality. Now this is based on their shared meanings and understandings of the stress they're experiencing it's based on the role expectations inside the family. And so one family would have a, a, one way of viewing stress, their own symbolic interactionism, and another family might have another way of dealing with stress, their own symbolic interactionism. And these two families would be very different in the way they respond to the same stressor. Think about the, the societal stresses that we've had in New Orleans, things like hurricanes or responses to murder or carjackings or crime. Some people move out of state um, because they're terrified by the crime. I have a friend who moved to North Carolina because she was so afraid of the crime in New Orleans. Other people buckle down and try to fix it. Well, it's the same with families. Some families, when they are under stress, respond stronger and better and more functionally than other families. That's because in their minds, they think of stress differently. Their symbolic reality, their symbolic understanding, their, their understanding of the stress that they're experiencing is different than in other families. Furthermore, the way families function together, the role expectations, who does what in the family, what's expected of the father or the mother or, or the, you know, the, the parents, uh, what's expected of the uh, children based on age and gender and other roles, all those things lend themselves to ways of coping with stress. So with this in mind, go and watch the other videos, take the quizzes, the quiz on this video and the quiz on the other videos, do the discussion board, do the reading, and then it'll be time to move on to module two. All right, I'll see you on the flip side. In the meantime, if you need anything from me, don't hesitate to contact me, kbrown at suno.edu, or call me, 504-286-5052. You can see my office hours and everything else you need on the, um, on the syllabus and elsewhere in the various introductory modules to this course. Okay, go get some work done. Bye-bye.